So if you're joining me here today, what we'll be doing is we'll be going through week 12 late or week 13 labor and payroll. Um, and for now, I also will be bringing up to show you the different format for it would have been week 10 depreciation. So let me just share my screen here. Okay. So I'm going to bring this in. Okay. So what basically what we did for um, a last, I guess, two weeks ago for the week 10 depreciation, it looked a little something like this. This is this new lawnmower. Um, and basically what I did, I, I was just giving you these big blocks and saying, can you tell me what the annual and five-year depreciation is? And then through that little thing, you did the math and you figured it out. Rather, what I would like you to do is fill out this little chart. Now, this chart was looked at in our actual PowerPoint. So when you see this on the test, I don't want you to get weirded out or feel like you weren't taught this. Um, so it is in the PowerPoint and it will tell you how we do these. But also when you look at this, what we'll be doing is showing your annual depreciation, the accumulated, so the year after year and how much it adds, and the accumulated will basically take away from the book value. And I'll, and I'll show you what this means real quick. So for, in this particular scenario, new mower, 35,000, um, salvage cost of 3,000, so, so $32,000 is the amount of depreciation over five years. So I can do that here. Um, so it'd be 32,000 divided by five. And because this is straight line depreciation, this is just gonna stay the same. 6,400, 6,400. Um, and I think we all did this in class. This is the answer that you got. Now, accumulated, accumulated depreciation basically means how much over the years has it depreciated? So it'd be 6,400. And then the next year, it'll be 6,400 times two. And then 6,400 times three. So that's three years worth. And so on. And so and 6,400 times five. Now, there we go, 32,000, as we said, that's the cost minus the salvage value, right? 35,000 minus 3,000, it's 32,000. And here we can see exactly, that's the amount that it's depreciated over the five years. And then this part is basically the reverse. So it will be 35,000 minus the accumulated depreciation. And we're just going to keep doing that same 35,000 minus two years of accumulated depreciation. 35,000 minus three years. It just cleans it up a little bit, makes it a little bit easier to follow this chart. Um, and then you will see, whoops, I, yeah, no, that's right. And then you will see at the end, we should have $3,000 worth of our book value, which we do. Okay. So. Annual depreciation of 6,400. This number doesn't change when it comes to straight line method because it's just always the same amount. Accumulated depreciation is just the ever increasing amount over the years of how much it's actually gone down in value and book value is what, what did it start as in value and the slowly decreasing amount until finally we are left over with our salvage value. So it'll be the same thing except for in here these amounts are going to change, obviously, um, just because annual will be based on the estimated estimated useful life and the annual outputs. Now, we're not going to give you, um, we might just say, hey, we think it'll last eight, 800 mowing hours per year. What do we say up top here? Um, four days a week, eight hours a day. So 32 hours times 52 weeks, assuming there's no winter. So 32 times 50 to 1664. I think you guys remember this. So basically using that one, that's going to be the annual depreciation. Um, Cause again, we don't know what the five years of actual use was. We're just guessing that that's what we think we're going to use. So same thing. I just want you, you all to understand how that works. Okay. Any questions on that? It's not much different. It looks a little bit different and that will be in the test. And of course, um, that'll be as part of the test review. It's open book test. You can refer to that PowerPoint to take a look and see how that's done. Um, and yeah, are we good there? Thumbs up, thumbs down. 
Party hat? I don't care. Send me something. Jump on the chat. Oh, the chat is, there's actually something there. Can you please upload the Excel sheet? <clears throat> um, I will upload that Excel sheet 100%. So I'm going to put it on all under week 13. I'll upload that Excel sheet. I will upload this PowerPoint that I'm about to get into, um, as well as this recording for you. Okay. Moving on. All right. So labor and payroll. What do we need to know? Why is it important? Um, don't get screwed over. Make as much money as you can. And since, and I've said this before to you all, because you're, we are in now in an environment where the employee has the, the strength, has the upper hand, and it's hard to find employees. Uh, in was all in, Unemployment in Canada is at its lowest rate that it has been in like 35 years, which means there's lots of jobs. There's not a lot of people for those jobs. And should somebody not want to play by the rules, and usually if they're trying to play by the rules, they're trying to get away with something, then you have you have many different avenues that you can explore. You can try different positions. You can just say no. Um, you know, if there, there's, I'll, we'll talk about different ways that some people might try to do things, and sometimes they may work out for the employee. That's on your own to decide what to do. Um, but we'll go through all the generic basics of what you must understand about labor and payroll. And then we'll, we'll break down actually how hiring somebody uh, can affect your business. So the first thing is payroll accounting. Uh, so this is just a part of accounting. I don't know if you remember, but they talked about five different branches of accounting. Uh, payroll accounting is one of those. And it basically is how people are paid, how it affects your business. What are the employer responsibilities? Because there are many. Um, what kind of deductions are there from every pay? And this, how do we budget for that? So we have daily and weekly work amounts by law. So unless a contract of employment or there's a collective agreement, which is usually there's a union which has a collective agreement, that's what we had as faculty when why we also almost went on strike. Overtime is calculated on a weekly basis. So Yes, I have seen um, places, so a Casino Rama, as an example, will pay you overtime on a daily basis. So anytime you work over eight hours, you start getting time and a half. So 1.5 times your, your hourly rate. Typically, it's not until you work more than 44 hours in a week. So that's when you start receiving overtime. Um, you can agree not to get overtime. I don't know why you would. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, if you're working for $20 an hour, why would you agree? If you're working really hard that week, why would you agree to not make $30 an hour and instead keep making 20? It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, an employee should have a minimum of 11 hours off between shifts. This is a tough one as well. Um, by law, you should have 11 hours because they kind of work in, you need eight hours of sleep, but you need like a little wind down time and time to wake up and have a shower and, and get going. Um, you know, if it happens once in a blue moon, whatever, but if you have a regular schedule where you're working till two or three in the morning and they want you back there for breakfast at 8 a.m., it just doesn't work. It's not, doesn't, that's bad scheduling. So you should say, hey, I need a little bit more time off in between these shifts. An employee shall not, now, <clears throat> let's try that again. An employee shall not work more than 60 hours in a week Again, unless otherwise agreed to. So some of you, your workers, you were like to work hard. You don't care that you work 70 hours in a week because you're trying to make money. Sure, go ahead. Um, but they can't force you to work more than 60 hours in a week. Okay, you can agree to it, but they can't make you. And you can't lose your job over it. Just like you can't lose your job about getting um, no overtime. And they can't cut your shifts because you didn't agree to overtime. None of this stuff. So breaks, breaks are interesting. Um, so there's no actual legal requirement for an employer to give any breaks other than eating periods. So often when you get breaks at work and in our industry, they don't really happen. 
um, because we're just based on business, right? So business is busy, you're working hard. If it's not busy, well, you're probably not doing much and that's kind of like a break. Um, Hold on, let me just open my chat and make sure I'm not missing anything. Please ask me questions, as many as you want about this, or even like privately send me a message saying like whatever scenario you're in, I can give you a little bit of guidance. Um, even the Co Georgian College Career Center can kind of speak on your behalf if you have an employer. Um, and especially for a co-op, someone like Lindsay Byers can reach out and be like, no, you, you pay our employees properly or you don't get our students and they will abide. Um, so make sure we know about this stuff because often we don't know about it because you guys are, you just don't wanna rock the boat. You know, you don't wanna tell on anyone, but if it's hurting you, we don't wanna push our students to go to these places that don't treat people properly, right? So just make sure we're aware of this stuff. Even if it's your co-op after school, it's good to know. Um, Employee must, if employee works over five hours, they must get a 30 minute paid break, paid meal break. Okay. So that's just, again, a nutritional, you got to keep your, keep your workers happy and working. Um, and that has to be 30 minutes away from work. So it's not sitting at your desk, chowing down on a sandwich while answering emails. That's not a paid 30 minute break. You must be able and free from work during those times. Overtime pay. So overtime, basically it's one and a half times. And then depending on some institutions and different companies, you might even get more. So yeah, you get one and a half times overtime pay, but if you work on a Saturday and it's overtime, you might get two times the regular amount, or I've even seen up to three times the regular amount. Um, so, you know, for me, I don't care if I work Christmas Eve, I don't care if I work or I didn't care back in the day if I worked Christmas Eve. I didn't care if I worked New Year's Day, like family day, who cares? like throw me in there. I will, I'll make time and a half. I'll make more money for the same work. Um, and I'm sure many of you are, are similar. So when you, when you think about overtime, it's anything over 44. So as an example, Robbie's regular pay is $14 per hour. Um, if Robbie worked 46 hours, he would get his 44 hours of regular pay plus two overtime hours calculated at 1.5. So if he was making $14 per hour, he's now making $21 per hour. Um, and then, then you would just go through, add in your regular pay, add in your overtime pay to get your total and give you an idea of how much you're owed for that week of work. Now 14 is low, it's now $15. So our minimum wage is now $15 as of January 1st. And I believe I heard Doug Ford talk not too long ago saying that he's going to raise it up to 1550. I don't know if anyone else heard that 1525. It's quite a bit. Um, but so is everything else. It's not even matching inflation. I like everything's expensive. I totally get it. You know, I think I'm almost at that age now where I can't complain anymore. Um, <laughs> because you know, I'm not, I, I still think I'm young, but now I'm, I'm not young, I'm, I'm old. Um, and now I'm at a point where like housing really did cost a lot less and schooling and rentals did cost a lot less where before it was like, yeah, I get it. Um, it was really expensive for me more so than the generation before me, but now I'm just too many years between us where I do feel for you and it's tough out there. Like it's, more difficult than it was for me. I, I'll just, I'll admit that. So good luck. Um, <laughs> minimum wage, $15. Now, if you are a liquor server, this is where I see something great because before you can see liquor servers, which is just a horrible name for it, but people that receive gratuities essentially as part of their pay, it was twelve fifty-five, and now they brought it right up to 15. Um, while I think this affects some tipping, like maybe you'll have less tips. There's a lot of servers out there that are making a lot more money because of this, because you know, it's only $2 and 50 cents more an hour, but over the year, that's a lot more money. Plus they're still making gratuities as opposed to the person that works at a retail store that makes $15 an hour and no gratuities. If you can serve and you can hack it and you can handle the tables and have a smile on my face, it is like I've done it, I did it until I was 30. 
part time working at the keg and other places. And then I, I left because I thought I'm 30. I'm going to get stuck. Uh, and a lot of people get stuck because it's easy money. It's fast money. Um, you know, if you need more money, you just go to work and you make 200 bucks, 300 bucks that day and then go spend it. And if you need more money the next day, you go do the same thing. It's like we call it the golden handcuffs because you'll it's hard to get out of that because you usually need to take a pay cut to go do something else to get out of the serving industry. Now, that being said, there's not a better way to make quick, easy, non-taxed money. Um, so good luck doing that. That's that's if you can do it, I recommend doing that even as a part time job, even if you have a full time work a day or two serving lots of lots of opportunity out there. Um, holiday pays. So we all get paid automatically for public holidays. So there's nine of them in Ontario. It's fantastic. Um, these are the nine New Year's Family Day, Good Friday, which is coming up this upcoming Friday. Uh, Victoria Day, Canada Day, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas and Boxing Day. So those are the nine that we get paid for. Now, there's a way that we do it. So basically, it's calculated by taking the previous four weeks of work, dividing it by 20. Of, so the expectation is five days a week. So they, they say, OK, <coughs> the typical employee over four weeks of work, which is 28 days, work 20 of them. They work five days a week and they have a weekends off or they have two days off. Um, they put a couple rules to this. So they said the first and last rule is that the employee must work the regular work day scheduled before and after to receive their public holiday. Because when these public holidays would come, let's say it's on a Friday, so many people would call out sick on Thursday. They might not show up on Monday. And now they gave themselves like a five day vacation. So basically they said, okay, we got to pay you on this public holiday, but we're not paying you if you don't show up for work around the either ends of them. Like you're really kind of messing up our business. So that's what they did there. Uh, employees in our industry work often work holidays. So if you work these holidays, we, we will make double time and a half, which is great because we'll always get our one and a half times pay for the average amount of hours that we work. Okay. So it's a little different. You can't think, Hey, I worked 15 hours on that particular day. I should get time and a half rather it'll be an average. So if you, let's make it easy. Um, you work five hours a day typically. So for 20 days times five, uh, I don't know why that's so difficult. That's a hundred hours. So you work uh, on average a hundred hours. So basically what they would, they would do is that they would pay you on average the, for five hours, even if you worked 15 on that one particular day, you know, if you worked 15 on that one day, maybe you'd go, you get paid for five and a half hours because it raised your average, but that's the way that that would work. It's not, Hey, let's work on just that holiday day and gouge them. You'd still get your, your pay for the day, but then you get a little top up. I don't know if that's confusing. I'm just looking to the chat. That's just the way it works. Um, so if you're ever worried about not getting a proper amount or if they missed it, if you can figure out, add up your four weeks of work previous to the day divided by 20, you, that'll tell you how much you should get paid per hour or how many hours you should get paid for time and a half. Um, vacation pay. So this is a good one because often what happens is that we don't get vacation or they give us um, uh, an extra percent on our paycheck, but they don't give us actual vacation time. So it's very dependent. So if you're an hourly employee, typically what they do is that they don't give you two weeks or three weeks of paid vacation. Rather, what they do um, is that they pay each employee an extra four to six percent of the wages earned, which sometimes is nice because you know you don't need two weeks off work. I just need more money. So, so many people are okay with that. So if you are a salaried employee, so you get paid fifty thousand dollars a year. It doesn't matter how many hours you really work. Um, you know, if you work sixty hours that week, you still get fifty thousand a year. If you work twenty hours that week. You still get 50,000 that year. So salary pay is often what people do, especially in our industry for any management, because we have busy days and we have non or busy months and we have non busy months. So if I pay my front desk manager $70,000, I know from the May long weekend until Labor Day, 
So all June, July, and August, they're working a ton. They're working more than they probably should. But I also know come January, February, March, they're not gonna be working a lot. So it kind of balances out that way. Um, it also gets away from your employee not having a steady pay and maybe they're making a ton of overtime in the summer, but they're not making, they're only getting 20 or 30 hours of work in, um, in the off season. So this way it's easier. You pay your employees the same every single month. It's much easier to budget. You get by law two weeks of paid vacation if you're offered a salary. So two of the 52 weeks a year, you will get paid your regular pay and you do not have to report to work. Now you can take this paid vacation any way you want. It could be just in a block. It can be, you know, I want to take, it's 10 days. So I want to take 10 Fridays off and give myself 10 long weekends, whatever kind of works. After five years, you get three weeks of paid vacation. Now, again, this is the minimum. This is by law. So when someone offers you, we're going to give you $50,000 a year plus two weeks paid vacation. I don't want you to think that they're doing you anything great by doing that. They're literally just obeying the, the very minimum that they must give you, right? So don't act like I get two weeks paid vacation. Yeah, that's so awesome. No, everyone gets that. That's not a big deal. I got free healthcare. Yeah, everyone gets free healthcare. What else are they doing? So that's something I just want you to think about. Two weeks paid vacation. Don't get too excited about it. Go for three weeks. You're like, well, two is the, the minimum based on this, you know, this level of work and how long you want me for in my education. I believe that three weeks paid vacation might be uh, warranted. They can say no. Um, you know, you have to be a little careful as far as asking for too much because you might, you might get fired, but you could or might not get the job. But you can always ask for two weeks, and then after six months, once you've earned your your pay and like you've become a really required worker then you can say, I think two weeks is a little light. I think I'd like three. Um, or they can pay you four to 6%. That 6% would be after five years of employment. Or you can ask for more when you get into that negotiation. Often those uh, amounts, so those four to 6%, they're paid out usually on each of your paychecks, but sometimes they're paid out in a lump sum. So uh, employees can request it whenever. I remember when I worked at the keg, uh, they paid it out right before the summer and then again right before the christmas holidays which was kind of like a nice little little chunk to have so how people are paid so uh, i don't know if you remember these personal tax credit forms basically what you are doing is when you fill out this uh, particular piece of paper you are saying what your expectation is in which to uh, make for the year so they'll ask you like if you are going to be over a certain amount of money um, and you have to tell them what you think your wage or salary will be. In this form as well, there are some things that you can write off. So if you are a caregiver or you have a dependent at home, um, you know, if you have a sick mother that you're taking care of and lives at your house as well, there are some deductions in this form. There's also, you can request to take more tax off than, than actually is required. Um, I often used to do that because I'd have two jobs. And, they, and these, I fill up two of these forms, but they wouldn't really talk to each other, right? So yeah, I'm making $30,000 over here, but I'm making another $30,000 doing this. And I don't want to pay a lot of tax. So usually I'd ask for a little bit more taken off. So wage is an hourly variable rate versus salary, which is a fixed amount regardless of hours worked. This is a little bit more difficult to fill out when you have your hourly amount because you don't know how much you're going to actually make because um, it's all based on schedules, but the, if you have salary, it's much easier. And this gives you an idea of what maybe a pay statement might look like. So you'll have your period, your employee ID of John Smith, the period ending and the pay date. So for what two weeks, usually it says the period start and end date. So it'll tell you for what two weeks are you getting paid for, and then the actual pay date. Um, so it looks like here they're actually getting paid for work that they have yet to complete, but whatever. They'll have the, your regular uh, income, your rate. So they, this person worked 80 hours at $20 an hour for $1,600 and also worked five hours for um, $25. So that is not 1.15 or 1.1, 1.5. It should be 30. 
but let, regardless, they should have the overtime stated on your paycheck. And then, then come the deductions. So CPP, EI, income tax, union dues, life insurance, long-term disability, Canada savings bonds. They give you a current amount of all of this coming off your paycheck, as well as how much you've paid off this year to date. Your year to date gross is how much um, you should be getting. So if you're trying to make 50,000 a year, this should say 50,000. They'll have the, your year to date deductions and how much you've actually taken home. Um, your current total, your deductions and your net pay. So if I'm supposed to make 1725 a week or every two weeks, I only get 1300. That's not horrible. Um, but the thing is you actually have to base your life on getting 1300 every two weeks, not 1725. And that's a, a mistake I think a lot of people do. You know, they think, oh, I make 20 bucks an hour, so if I work eight hours, I should have $160 to, to work with. It doesn't work like that. You know, if you make $160, maybe you have 100 of it or 115 of it to work with. So how does this all work? Okay, so these are the legal requirements. Um, so employment insurance premium, so EI. During COVID, EI became this huge thing that almost every single person that lost their job was able to partake in. Um, so it's employment insurance. Usually we see it with seasonal workers. So they might work for eight, nine, 10 months, and then their resort closes, their, the farm doesn't operate anymore, the fishing season's over, um, and then they take EI for a couple months until it starts back up again. Um, same thing with like cruise season, same thing with resort work it happens. So employees must pay 1.58% of their earnings to a maximum amount of 952. So this, no, this number usually goes up every single year. Um, you know, I think last year was 920 something and it was 1.4%. So now it's gone up. So you can pay up to $952 and 74 cents, but you won't pay over that. So you'll never pay over a thousand dollars. So if you make 40,000 a year and you have to pay 1.58%, you pay about $632 a year. So the employer must pay 1.4 times that amount, okay? So um, it's not 1.4%, it's 1.4 times that amount or 140% of that amount that you pay. So if you pay 632, they would have to pay, you'd multiply that by 1.4, they would pay $884.40, up to this maximum of 1333.84, which is 40% higher than this one. So that's kind of how EI works. You have to pay some, but the employer has to pay as much as you, plus an additional 40%, so even more. Um, so CPP, so this is something that's great. I don't know, don't know if you can you tell me ladies and gentlemen do you pay cpp if you're an international student do you remember do you ever remember seeing that on a pay stub cpp it's canada pension plan yes you do i i think you do okay i only got one one thumbs up. All right, CPP, it's actually great. It's actually something that, yes, you don't want money taken away from you, but the great thing about the Canada Pension Plan is Canada understands that we don't save money very well. We're not very good at it. We're just bad. Like, I don't save as much. You don't save as much you should. So what they said is, we are going to take a chunk and we're going to put it away for you. So then when you are able to retire, you have savings already. So what you may not understand is that every single person here that has been working in Ontario is already saving 5.7% of your, um, all of the income that you make. And it's, that, it's there, it's money, like you, you will get it. I don't even care if you're not in Canada anymore. When you turn, I think you can take it as early as 60. When you turn 60, there will be some money it might not be a lot, but there'll be some money waiting for you. Everyone employed between the ages of 18 and 65 must pay. Employees also must match contribution. 
So that's a big one. So the employees have to match your 5.7%. So you're actually, you're not saving 5.7%. You're saving 11.4, double that. Because you'll save an amount of money, but the employer's going to match it. So you're already saving 11.4% of all the income that you've ever earned, which is fantastic, right? This is a great thing for you. I don't get upset about paying um, the 5.7%. I get upset about income tax because I feel like our country is run by idiots sometimes. But this one here goes right into my bank account for later. It's a, my the best savings plan that you can ever have um, because you invest 5.7, they match it. It's 100% growth, right? That You double your money by not doing anything. There is a maximum and, a, and uh, an exemption. So if you don't make $3,500 a year, you don't actually have to pay any CPP. And this is kind of for like students or people who are on such part-time work that, you know, they might do a couple little small things here and there, but they're not making much. Um, the maximum contribution, let's just call it 3,500 is, um, is 3,500. So you can't invest more than $3,500. At that point, they max out and they say, okay, employers can't match unlimited amount of money that you put in. They can only match a certain amount. Uh, and then the self-employed individuals may pay themselves up to 11.4 into the CPP plan as well. So there's some links here if you want to check that out. Um, other ones are income taxes. So employees are taxed both federally and provincially. So usually it's a little bit different depending on the province that you live in. So if you live in Quebec versus Ontario, you'll have a little bit less or more tax taken off you. And this is all determined on how much money you make, which you should have put in that, that one tax form at the beginning. Uh, and we're gonna look at the tax rates. And then we also have the voluntary payroll deductions. So these are things that you could sign on to. So if you want insurance, sometimes the company will offer you insurance, but you have to pay a portion of it. It will we'll match seven, we'll cover 75% of the cost, but you need to pay 25%. Or if you're part of a union, there might be union dues. Um, there might be savings plans that you can invest into. I know like for us at Georgian, we can do savings plans. We have all kinds of um, medical stuff we have to pay for. We have to pay union dues and we can also pay into like scholarship. Like I have like $5 every two weeks that go into a scholarship for one of the professors that passed. Um, like things like that, right? Okay, so um, there are federal and uh, provincial tax brackets. And let me just go to maybe this one here because it looks a little cleaner. So provincially you get taxed and federally you get taxed. Um, they, don't, they don't separate these on a pay stub, they just say income tax. But this is the way it breaks down. So um, you get taxed more when you make more. And if you don't make a lot, you don't pay a lot. So if you made $40,000 as an example, you are this zero to 45,000. So zero to 45,000, you would only pay 5%, 5.05% on that. That's provincially. And then in the federal part, which is Canada as a whole, zero to 50,000, you pay 15%. So you're paying about 20% income tax, right? You get a hundred, you, you make a hundred dollars, you keep 80. That's not that bad. Free healthcare, we have roads, we have parks, we have lights, we have police and fire and, and things like that. That's what, that pays for. Now, for good or bad, if you are more successful, you pay more. A uh, little socialist, but I'm okay with it, whatever. So the next tax brackets are not zero. So let's say you make $90,000. It's not, I don't pay now 9.15% on $90,000. Rather, I pay 5.05 5 on the first $45,000 I make. And then from 45 to 90, I pay 9.15%. Okay, so it's a little bit different. You have to do the math where you say, okay, 45, 142 times 5.05 is such an amount of money. And then 45, 142, um, or go 90,000 minus that 45 that you've already paid tax on will tell you how much money you're paying 9% on. And if you were to make 90,000 to 150, you pay 11, 12, and over 220,000, which I hope you all do, 
you make you have to pay 13% on that. And then you'll see federally these amounts go up as well. So at a certain point, if you let's say you make two hundred and twenty two thousand dollars, you pay anything over that two hundred and twenty thousand, you pay thirty three plus thirteen. So forty six, almost fifty percent of your income. Not on all of your income, only the amount that's over that. So that's why people have, always have this weird thing where they'll they'll tell a story where. They're like, oh, well, I got offered a $105,000 job or a promotion. So I went from 90 to 105,000, but I turned it down because I don't want to pay extra tax or something like that. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense because you only pay extra tax on that small amount that's over it. So in this scenario, you know, if you made 90,000, then you got a promotion and a new job to 105 from 90 to 105, you would pay that 11, 16. The rest still gets taxed at those lower rates. So that's the big part to remember. It's not, you don't jump entirely into this new tax bracket or higher tax bracket. Rather, just that portion that falls between these two numbers, you get taxed higher at. Okay, and then there's other additional stuff that we've talked about. You know, there might be gym pass. Yeah, I have a gym pass. There might be meal plans, de dental, medical, stuff like that. Um, so it, in looking at a $40,000 salary, these are the things that you would have to pay. So you pay $632 in your EI. You pay $19,1625 in CPP. $2,020 for income tax, provincially, about $6,000 federally. There's about $10,500 that you lose. So if you're making $40,000, you're taking home a little less than, than $30,000. Right, so you're paying about a little over 25% of your um, pay. That's that's okay. That's pretty low. So um, in, there's other employer contributions outside of the ones that they're matching. So they match DEI, they match CPP. That's great. Uh, but they also might have health programs. So um, there's an employer health tax. So some some employers don't have to pay it. Some do. It's complicated. But for most business, it's usually one to two percent. You have to pay to ensuring that employers are healthy. And then there's workman's compensation. So workman's compensation is basically workers insurance. So if you are in a dangerous position, you're underwater welder, this might be 20 percent of salaries. If you are retail, it might be two percent. Typically, we just say five and leave it at that. And then also CPP matching, which we said, so 5.7. So it's not actually 10.5, that should be 11. And their in employer insurance premiums of 1.4 times the empl employee's 1.58% contribution. So we'll look at this in a couple scenarios and I'll lay it out. So when you make your $40,000, your EI, so this is the employer contributions, or okay, or the employer pay. So we looked at the employee up here somewhere. Forty thousand dollars, they get to take home twenty nine four thirty one. All right. Now, as an employer, I have to pay forty thousand plus plus plus. So here I am. I offer them forty thousand um, dollars, and who we got here? All right, Simone. Simone gets an, an offer for $40,000, which honestly in today's age is fairly low, but maybe a good starting rate, depending. If it's a company you want to work for and they're offering 40, eh, that's, that's lower, but um, yeah, you know, I think 45, 50 is a really standard place to start. So 40,000, um, they would have to pay EI premiums of 884. They would have to match your CPP that you paid. They pay an employer health tax of 2%. So that's 40,000 times 2% is 800. They pay a workman's compensation of 5%. So 40,000 times five is 2000. And then your vacation pay. So because you're uh, a junior employee, you're coming in, you have no experience really. We're, we're giving them 4%, which is $1,600. So really my $40,000 pay that I offered cost me 47. So that's the thing we need to think about. If you have a budget, you're like, hey, we're able to pay a manager 
$60,000. We can't offer them 60,000 because it is probably going to end up being like 75 after I do all this stuff. So at 60, I might have to offer them 52,000. So I don't pay more than 60 after all of the extras. So that's also something to keep in mind when an employer offers you a salary that they have a lot of other bits that they have to pay off. Um, so if they offer you a $60,000 job, you actually are like, they're paying $72,000 to have me as an employee. They, my gross pay might only be 60, but they're also, you know, paying all this other stuff. So this is the, this is the style of question that I'm going to give you right here. So the next three slides are exactly what the assignment is. So there'll be, um, different amounts of information given to you. Using those amounts of information and using what we've just talked about, you will have to determine what the employer true cost is, as well as what the employee actually gets to keep. So this is the, the breakdown. So Ayush has owned his own hotel business for 30 years and is ready to retire. His son has worked for him for 10 years, is ready to take over, by, but Ayush isn't sure the true cost of his son's salary. So what would a $70,000 salary look like for true cost to Ayush in the hotel? How much would his son actually take home after taxes and deductions? And he also wants a benefit plan for his son, which will cost an additional 10% of his base wage. So what we have to do now is go through and determine, okay, what's it actually gonna cost to hire my son and make sure my, my business does well. So base wage, you put in $70,000. Then we'll have to, for the employer, we're adding, so make sure you do this, because this is often a mistake. If you're an employee, so if we're looking at employee amount or employee deductions, we're reducing our from our base wage. From an employer, we are adding to the base wage because we also have to pay these things. So EI premiums, it's max $884 for employees and max 1,238 for employers. Um, if you were to do 1.58 times 70,000 times 1.4, so 1.58 is the uh, 1.58, sorry, percentage times 70,000 times 1.4, this would actually be $1,584. Now, the maximum is this amount right here, 1,238, 16 cents. So that's what we would put there. Match our CPP contributions, so 5.25 um, times 70 minus 3,500. So seven, there is a, an exemption of the first $3,500 you do not pay. So all the base wages for CPP, take away 3,500 first and then multiply it. So it's five points, oh, I think it's 5.7. Let me double check. 5.7, this is why we're doing this. So 5.7, regardless, I know it's going to be over um, that 3,500. I'm just gonna pull out a calculator and double check. So I'll show you here how we would do it. All right, calculator. So he's getting $70,000. Take away 3,500, it's 66,500 times. Now I want to apply it by 5.7%. I'm going to go 0 0.057, but there's also a percentage. So you could have multiplied that by 5.7 and hit the percentage button. 3790 and 50 cents. So because 3790 and 50 cents is more than the maximum, we're just going to put 3,500 in there. Then our employer health tax, which is 2% of 70,000. Our work, work, workman's comp, which is 5% of 70,000. Vacation pay. So here it's gonna be 6% because we said if, if they work over for the company more than five years, they automatically go up to 6%. So now it's 6% of 70 is 42. And then we also said, Ayush also wants a benefit plan for his son, which will cost an additional 10%. So 10% times 70 is 70,000. Or seven thousand. In total, it's about ninety-one thousand dollars that this employer would have to pay 
to give his son a $70,000 wage. So $21,000 more than what the wage is. So that's something to think about. And then when we think about the actual employee, what is he actually keeping? This is what we're going to do. So we're going to take his amount of money, which is our base wage of 70. And what you have to do here is say, okay, the first 45,000 times 5% is 2,279. Now the next step, so if it falls within these two amounts, what you'll do is you'll say 70,000 minus 45,142, which is the amount we've already paid tax on, times 9.15, because that's the tax uh, bracket or tax rate for this amount, equals this amount, 2,274. Um, if his wage was 110,000, what we do is we would just say 90,000, 287 minus 45,142 times 9.15. And if it was 110, we'd go 110 minus that 90,278, because that's the amount we've already paid tax on times 11.16. Basically what we're trying to do here, and if, if this makes it easier, you, you would only pay tax on every dollar once. We're just trying to determine, is it 5%? Is it 9% or 11 or 12 or 13? So if you have 70,000, we pay 5% on the first 45,000, and then we pay 9% on the remaining. 70 minus 45, 142. And then do the same thing for federal, although these are higher amounts. So you'll see that we end up paying $4,554 for provincial tax, 11,589 for federal, um, although on a, on a pay stub, they would combine these. And then we would do our employee true salary. So 70 minus our EI premiums, minus our CPP, apologies, uh, minus our provincial tax or federal tax and other, which there is none, but should they have had union dues or they bought into a gym pass or who knows what, it might be there. Their net income is about $50,000, 49472 So that's interesting to know. They started at 70. They're taking home less than 50. So determine how much we actually make. If I took the amount that I made divided by my base wage um, and times it by 100, I would realize that I make about 70% of my net income, of my gross wages. I keep about 70% and I'm taxed about close to 30%. Okay. It's, maybe it's confusing, but this is something that you will have to literally deal with for the next, what are you, 20, 22, 25, 40 years of your life, where you have to understand what deductions that you have. So what, what money do I have to work with? What money do I have to play with where I want to be, I want to become financially sustainable, right? I want to be at, at the very least, I want to be comfortable and be able to do fun things. So I have to budget off 50,000 a year, not 70,000 a year because that's, and although some of this is good. So if I ever lose my job, there's EI, I'm already investing 11.4% of my money into a, a retirement fund. I'm paying taxes and everything to the government, but that means that, you know, I reap the benefits of healthcare, dental care, daycare, tax subsidies, all the stuff that we get for paying this. And I don't think they, we do a great efficient job of that. I think we use all of this money to buy votes. That's political. It's neither here nor there. Um, but there's a reason that we pay tax. That's all. It just sucks. <laughs> uh, okay. So that is um, this particular lesson. What we'll do now is that we'll jump into the actual assignment. I can pull it up for you real quick and show you what's up. And then you will complete it and submit it. So let me just pull up. Uh, oh, your marks are here. Okay, so under assignments, scroll all the way down, week 13, last one. Here we go. Give it a minute. Okay. 
So here we are, we have Amy. So Aaron, Amy's just been hired by Marriott International as a new revenue manager at a base wage of $94,000. Um, Amy has also agreed to become part of the union, costs her about 1% of her total wage, which is also matched by her employer. Complete the following charts and let Amy, let Amy know how much she can potentially take home and what the true cost was for Marriott International. So what you want to do here is go through this whole particular thing, fill out, you know, she makes 94,000. Let's figure out what her actual EI. Um, so this is the employer. So 1.58 times 1.4. Again, I'm so sorry. I keep forgetting to put percentages. It's percentages. You should know it. Um, your minimums and your max and all of your exemptions are all in here. So you just got to go through and do the math. And other costs would be that 1% that she agreed to. So what you'll do is you'll find the total employer true cost and then find out what the employee would pay in provincial and federal tax. And you would come up with her take home pay. All right, because she's making $94,000, um, just to kind of trip you up a little, she will be in three tax brackets in provincial, right? Anything over 92, so 94, she'll pay, you know, about $1,500 at 11%. And in this one, she'll just be in two tax brackets. First 50 is 15%, the next from 50 to 94 should be 20.5%. So there it is there, good luck. I gave you till 2 p.m. I didn't know how long this actual uh, conversation would go. Um, when you are thinking about the test, so I'll just stop um, sharing this. So when the test is coming up for next week, it's not unlike anything you haven't seen. It'll be on uh, Blackboard, fill in the blank. I'll give you like a financial statement and I'll ask you to fill in the blanks. Um, it will be two hours that you'll get. It's 50% of your final mark. And I think we're at a point where as long as you do, you know, 50%, you get 50% on the next couple of assignments, everyone seems to be in line to pass the class, which is great. I had my doubts at the beginning, but no, you guys pulled up your socks a bit. and I do appreciate that. Okay. So sorry for talking at you. I'll, I will stop the video here. Um, and if you have any questions, 